All right, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to session one of Happy at Home, Compassion and Change. My name is Anna Greenwald, and I am the founder and CEO here at On The Goga. I'm also a mindfulness coach and a registered yoga teacher, and I will be joined throughout this presentation series by the wonderful Andrew Campbell, uh, our program manager here at On The Goga, one of our awesome community health and promotion coaches. So welcome, Andrew. Hey, Anna. Thanks for inviting me. And hey, everyone out in the uh, stratosphere. <laughs> All right, Andrew. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here. How's this going to work? Why are we here? Right. So really why we're here, simply put, um, is because of you out there in the zeitgeist. Um, so generally at On The Go Go, we serve our members and local companies here in Philly. Um, and over the past few weeks, as obviously we all know, we've seen a lot of shifting to our daily lives. It was actually really inspiring throughout the, throughout that time, kind of one by one, each of our team members in some way or another brought up this idea of like, how do we help our community? Not only our Philadelphia community at large, the public community, but also just if our goal is to provide tools and resources for people to make themselves healthier and happier in a time right now where we're seeing a lot of need for that, what can we do? So we kind of came up with the idea for a webinar series to basically provide you with some tools, resources to keep yourselves healthier, happier at home. Um, and if nothing else, just give you kind of a 30 minute brain break in the middle of your day. So how it's really gonna work, again, each week for the next six weeks um, at noon until 12.30 uh, Eastern time. Um, we'll be here with various coaches um, and we'll give you a little preview of next week at the end of this webinar, but with different coaches from our amazing team, again, just giving you tools to bring a little bit more healthy, happy lifestyle um, to your everyday life. So. All, Anna and all of our coaches are the experts and incredibly gifted at all that. I, really what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to ask a bunch of different questions and try to be like quasi insightful. Um, and then hopefully we really enc encourage all of you out there to ask any questions that you see. So Anna, um, how are they going to be asking these questions? Well, first of all, I just want to state that you kind of just uh, you're about to undersell and over deliver Andrew. Cause I feel like you're always the one coming in with the insights on That's these. how I do it. That's how I do it. <laughs> um, but yes. Yeah, so as Andrew said, these are all designed to be as interactive as possible. Um, usually we're on site and in person for these types of things. So we want to create that environment here. I see a Dallas. I've seen a lot of Philly. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I saw an Ohio out there. So hello to yeah. the Midwest. I'm actually from Wisconsin. So I'm from Michigan. Shout out the Midwest. Yes. So yeah, Anna. Uh, who's this uh, other person knocking on the old line? Oh, I, I think I hear our amazing lead yoga and mindfulness coach. She is a yoga teacher of yoga teachers. She has her ERYT 500 hour certification from Yoga Alliance, the wonderful Caitlin Williams. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, y'all. I'm excited to be here today. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. We're so excited to have you. Um, how are you today? Uh, whoa. Um, let's see. How do people answer that these days? I, I always have a little bit of joy inside of me as well as a lot of sadness. Um, so that's about how I am. You know, um, I feel like that is just exactly how we're all feeling right now. Um, so I probably should have started by asking you the first question that we're going to throw out there to all of the people, which is actually what's one challenge that you face today? Oh, so a challenge. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, definitely, yes, all of you out there, feel free to put out your challenges. I I, I am a, a mother to a two-year-old um, son, and right before I was getting on this call, I literally handed them to my husband, who was on a call, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we tried to um, also conjure up some lunch, um, which he, of course, didn't want, but then wanted once we took it away. Um, so yeah, I mean, just juggling responsibilities of work and parenting is very interesting right now, if anybody can relate. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, working from home with children in the background, someone just said that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I'm seeing a lot of other really things that just resonate with me, this feeling of feeling isolated, juggling, um, you know, work at home. Normal. Yeah. What I feel, was that, Andrew? I saw one that's waking up at the normal time to go to work just because like when you're working from home, it's like, okay, so I'm supposed to get up 
and then walk like six feet over yeah. to mm-hmm. yeah someone, someone said kitchen cabinet distractions which I feel like is yeah. so relevant we're actually going to talk about that on a later podcast coming up this week so um, awesome. Well, clearly you guys have, uh, there's Olivia, one of our coaches saying yes, talking about kitchen cabinet distractions. <laughs> um, all right. So you guys have clearly figured out how to use the chat feature, which is amazing. Um, and these are all, all of these inputs are great segues because there's a lot of challenges and changes happening here and therefore a lot of opportunities for compassion. So Caitlin, compassion and change. Talk to us about how this is relevant to all of our lives right now. Sure. So um, when I thought about what aspect I thought we should bring as a tool to all of you, um, change and uncertainty obviously are a huge part of what's happening right now. Um, We are in this communal experience that is affecting us very individually and affecting our own well-being, um, whether that's emotional, uh, physical, or also, uh, you know, this this side of us that's very mental that is trying to tell us what should we be thinking right now, as well as the communal experience. We're watching people suffer. We're watching people really have a hard time, um, not only with this disease, but also economically. And, you know, like I said, these are these are all... um, ways in which we're, we're really needing to address our own distress and the distress of others. And so I really do believe compassion is a great tool to do that. Amazing. Um, so kind of moving into compassion, if we're going to talk about it today, let's first define it. So again, I'll toss this one back out to everybody out there listening. Uh, what do you think of when you think of compassion? What is compassion? This could be uh, a definition. This could be situations that you think about, words, ideas. Um, so throw out there, whatever you think of when you think of compassion. Andrew, what do you think of when you think of compassion? Uh, somebody just beat me to it. Shout out, um, shout out Milana on the team. <laughs> yeah, so honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is like empathy. Um, but, it, you know, I don't know if that's some sort of synonym to it. Um, but honestly, like the, as I'm unpacking it, it feels like compassion is the result of feeling empathy, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's what comes to my mind. Nice. Does anything, before we get into the definition, Caitlin, does anything come to your mind? Yeah, I've, I've just seen really wonderful acts of, of so much kindness. I'm seeing friends go see their grandparents through their windows, um, Mm -hmm. with signs that say, I love you, or, um, you know, opening up the window through a screen door and just having conversations is meeting, meeting people that are lonely and meeting people that, um, really do have a lot of, of, of fear around what's happening. So yeah, I'm seeing it a lot through, through friends. Yeah. And we have some amazing things coming up in this chat box. So, um, some Allison just said, listening with my seven-year-old, right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. feeling seen, which I think is so interesting, right. Cause we have a lot of caring, caring and kindness, uh, empathy, but even feeling seen, right. And allowing yourself to be, put yourself in a situation where you're surrounded by people who are experiencing your, Um, your distress. uh, Those are all amazing examples of compassion. So Caitlin, if we're going to define compassion, what is compassion actually defined as? So most commonly, um, compassion is defined around the Latin root word, um, which means to suffer with. Mm. And so it's this implication that we are with others within something that's usually really painful or just a bummer. (laughs) Yeah. very uh very reminiscent so I went to Catholic school for high school so it's like very much like <laughs> your life is suffering and that's so what do you mean? yeah <laughs> yeah so I should I should really unpack that for you because uh, I'm sure many listeners out there as well uh, might hear this word suffering and Anna and I have this in our work all the time this is a part of the history of all that we're doing but sometimes when you hear the word suffering you think like I'm getting my arm cut off <laughs> or um, being tortured in some way and and of course suffering Suffering can feel like that, but suffering is also this really large continuum. Um, we're all seeing suffering happening right now in a, in a really large continuum of this of this disease um, that's taking place in our world. Um, but also, I, I really want to draw in here that suffering can look like um, what I was experiencing before I got on this call, just this trying to feed my son and him not wanting it and me feeling like, oh, like, how do I handle this as a parent and be good to him and um, be patient? And, you know, so there's, there's a big continuum of suffering and what that can look like. I think that's 
so important and, and so interesting because that word suffering, right? We can think about it in a lot. You can replace that word with so many different things. You can replace it with distress, fear, mm-hmm. pain, even just stress, right? Um, and, and it can also feel like conflict, right? Competing priorities. Uh, if anybody else out there has ideas of, of things that they think of as just the day-to-day suffering that you guys are witnessing or experiencing right now, um, there really is that that big continuum. So Caitlin, let's touch too on, so we have compassion, right? But what, what is self-compassion? How is that similar? How is that different? So it's actually not much different than having compassion towards others. It's just that you're suffering with yourself. And so the object, instead of being outward, um, draws inward towards yourself. So uh, one of my favorite researchers of self-compassion is Kristen Neff. Um, I think she defines this in a really great way. Um, You all see the definition up on your screen. Instead of just ignoring your pain with a stiff upper limp mentality, um, you stop to tell yourself, this is really difficult right now. How can I comfort and care for myself in this moment? So I think we're really used to um, in, in our lives having the stiffer, a stiff upper lip mentality of saying like, how can I just get through this? Mm. Um, And so much of self-compassion is actually taking a pause and acknowledging your difficulty before you even take steps of working towards possibly um, finding solutions or being, um, being encouraging to yourself to be able to move forward. And so, you know, like I said, I don't think we're all very um, used to this way of being um, that we're all really told to just kind of like, pick ourselves up and and put our head down and move forward. Um, But self-compassion is the pause to look inward and acknowledge yourself. Mm. This this whole, like this definition, I love it. Um, And I really, it reminds me of the definition of mindfulness that we talk about all the time at On The Go-Go, which is, you know, essentially it's being with the, the negative, knowing that it will change and being with the positive, knowing that it won't always be this way, you know? So it's kind of like, acknowledging and stopping to tell yourself that's, that it's, this is really difficult. And I think that's a huge part of mindfulness and obviously self-compassion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, the last question here kind of nails it and sums it up. It's like, how can I comfort and care for myself in this moment? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's actually what we're going to talk about. Um, you know, how do we bring, we've, we've defined self-compassion in so many ways. Um, mm-hmm. How do we make self-compassion into a practice. And Caitlin, you have a really great uh, way to break this out into three components. So why don't you take us through uh, what that looks like? Yeah. So the first thing, Anna, is acknowledgement. So there has to be some kind of acknowledgement of the pain, suffering, or distress that you're feeling or that somebody else is feeling. How I like to put this into a picture is that if you can imagine yourself walking down the street and you see someone trip and fall and um, you know possibly fall on their knees or fall on their belly even on the sidewalk, your first internal feeling would be, ah, that's got to be hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're the person that's actually falling, that you're able actually to say you've first to yourself, ah, oh, this is not great. Instead <laughs> of, instead of like, oh, I tripped, how embarrassing. Mm. Um, so there has to be first just an acknowledgement of the pain and, and distress. Yeah. And for me, at least, um, specifically stress, like I can have like a really stressed day and I just think that's like, oh, it's just, I, I immediately turned to that stiff upper lip mentality where it's like, oh, well, that's just how life is, you know? Mm. Um, but I, it, that's a major part for me to just acknowledge Like I am stressed and it was a hard day. Mm -hmm. Right. And normally that's, I think, where a lot of us stop when we think about compassion, right? It's just the acknowledgement. But then what's, Caitlin, what's that next step? The next step is that you um, have some kind of action towards the distress that you're witnessing, whether it's towards somebody else or yourself. So when we go back to that picture of someone following on the sidewalk, is that your action would be that you go and pick them up. You go and help them or possibly their phone went flying and you go and find it for them. Um, You know, and with yourself again, is that if you were the one falling that you would tell yourself like, all right, let's see what we can do here. Can I, do I feel okay to pick myself up? Do I need to ask for help? And so it's creating action towards this distress that you're feeling. Mm. When I'm feeling stressed now that like I've, I'm trying to move past just the acknowledgement stage and the action for me is like, if I'm having a stressful day, you know, I've, especially now I've started taking like a nice, like 30 minute, 45 minute walk with my dog. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that just lets me like, there's nothing around that can really distract me by like work or anything. Um, and it gets me out and about. So, 
Mm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, um, someone in the chat brought up a really great point that self-care, right, is uh, the act of self-compassion. And so to your point, Andrew, there's the acknowledgement of, oh, I'm feeling stressed or I've had a long day. Or for me yesterday, it was even just, I haven't drank water in two hours, right? And then the act is going for a walk, grabbing water. Um, and to your point, Caitlin, that action can be something you do, right? Or like you talked about earlier, it can simply sometimes just be a thought or, you know, it's not, so, we can't necessarily go out and, and do a lot right now, but it can be a thought. Um, yeah. Christine yeah. just said she's journaling, which is an act of self-care. So yeah, it could be journaling. Absolutely. It's a way of being as much as it is action. Um, so the action can also be how you orient yourself to the situation instead of you actually doing something. Um, yeah. And then the last part I want to make sure to get through is that there's this understanding that the distress is actually part of this common humanity that we're all feeling. Uh, we all have a really um, a p big picture of this right now, that um, compassion, when it's when it's really experienced has all three of these components, that there's the acknowledgement of suffering, there's the action towards um, meeting that distress. And then there's this greater understanding that we are part of, of, of a greater humanity of people that also feel this way. Mm. So what I like to note here is this, why this understanding piece I believe is so important is that usually when we feel stress or um, anxiety um, or you know feel like we're suffering, many of you probably can remember a time where you felt really isolated because of those feelings. And, and what compassion really plays at is that you aren't, that you aren't alone, that other, other people in the world also are oriented this way and they've also felt this way. And so the, the last one I really do think um, ties all of this together, ties this practice together. For me, like it reminds me of, you know, to your point, Caitlin, like we're kind of all, essentially we're all in this together. And this, the situation that we've all found ourselves in as, you know, a world at this point, um, you know, is objectively bad and, it's, and it can be really difficult at times. Um, and a part of acknowledging and understanding that it's part of common humanity is like, you could even call it just like commiserating, mm. you know? Yeah, that, I think that connection piece is really interesting because I, a lot of us have felt, you know, how many of, raise your hand if you've had like a virtual happy hour over the last few weeks, right? Or you reach out to somebody that you don't normally talk to, right? So in this moment of compassion, when we realize that we're all experiencing a common um, pain, and it's, same, it's the same thing when you're experiencing a common goodness. It's that feeling of like, wow, I'm here with other people, um, which is especially relevant now that we're all separate. So this is great. Um, so this three components of compassion really helps us to understand that experiencing compassion in a way that can make our lives happier and healthier, no matter our circumstances, is this understanding that compassion is acknowledgement. And then the practice of compassion is also the action on that. And we're going to talk right now about all the different ways that that can look like. And why do that? Do that because it helps you feel better, right? I always like to say, if the only reason you're doing it is because it makes you feel better, that's a good enough reason to do it. Um, so let's move into that. Back to the practical compassion and change. Changes are happening all around us right now, which I've been thinking so much about this quote that I heard first in a yoga class, which is discomfort is the feeling of change, right? So many of us are experiencing changes. Some might be positive, right? I heard, saw somebody in the chat say that they uh, are enjoying working from home, but a lot of this change uh, is out of our control and it's not so positive. It's negative, in fact. Um, so but we can't move forward in talking about how we individually can be happy and healthy or well without first acknowledging this change, right? That acknowledgement piece um, and the discomfort that comes with it. But once we have that moment of acknowledgement, we can move into action. So Caitlin, you're gonna kind of take us through this matrix of compassion and action, all the different ways that action can look in the situation. So first we have this idea of self, there's the self-compassion and compassion for others, right? And then there's the, action that is internal, like the thoughts and the comfort we can give ourselves and others that is, you know, with words, with thought. And then there's the external behavior oriented. So talk to us a little bit about an action you can take that is for yourself, self-compassionate and internal, where you don't even have to really lift a finger. 
Yeah, I think the the first thing goes back to um, the acknowledgement of your stress. Many, like I said, many of us aren't in the routine of of taking a pause and understanding. Oh, like why why are we feeling this way right now? Um, but the acknowledgement of turning back inward and seeing and seeing and actually creating some knowledge about ourselves is really important. Um, obviously, that all then plays into that you being able to be more patient with yourself, being able to comfort yourself in the ways that possibly you're acting that maybe you don't want to. But then when you understand it's because of this underlying stress or underlying sadness or um, underlying, you know, ability to feel out of control right now, it then can provide a little more patient. You can provide yourself more patience. And one thing that uh, last week, actually, uh, Caitlin you were running us through like a quick like 10 minute meditation and mm -hmm. it kind of like became like very like self-reflective introspective as most meditations can be um and you kind of like asked us to consider uh what we're feeling and for me it was stress and instead of just like leaving it at stress i began to unpack it like what about it is stressing me um mm -hmm. so that was kind of like my version of what i immediately think think when i think internal compassion right it's that yeah. extra little pause Right. After the acknowledgement, that can be the action. So, Caitlin, let's talk about external. What does this look like for ourselves externally in action? Yeah, so I think a lot of people go right to um, hobbies or what maybe they enjoy doing um, by knowing themselves. So I'm even seeing in other participants saying that like they they are reaching out to people and creating their own Zoom meetings just to be able to feel not so self isolated. Um, and and of course, as a yoga teacher and mindfulness coach, I would encourage yoga and mindfulness. But taking a walk, reading a book, um, closing your computer when it's not serving you, um, being able to find again those pause and rest. But this can also look in a way of like how you're handling um, your finances right now to feel as though you're um, creating some compassion for yourself and, and, and drawing that compassion out. Awesome. So let's zoom through these next two. So compassionate acts for others. And yeah, John had a great one setting up a Zoom meeting, right, with your family. Mm -hmm. um, but things you can do kind of, what if, what are things you can do when you can't reach out to those people um, and, and you're just witnessing that suffering? Yeah, so having concern for others, this goes back to the orientation that you have. Um, so it sometimes doesn't look like always phoning, you know, phoning someone in or creating these Zoom messages, but also having an orientation in which you're just thinking about the world, or maybe you're thinking about family members that are, are feeling a lot of fear around this right now. Um, that goes into your own practices and, and your own beliefs and how you can actually orient that through possibly prayer or good thought, or someone said journaling earlier. I think that's really great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then external compassion for others. What can that look like now when we can't move? <laughs> of course. Yeah. I really see this. Um, a lot of people are doing this well, buying locally, um, reaching out, um, to people that, that need again to be heard or like all of you are saying, I'm really proud of all you on the chat yeah, room of just awesome. saying that you're, you're taking initiative to set up things to create connection. I think that's a really great way. Amazing. So guys, feel free to list all of the examples of ways that you are acting to bring compassion into your life. And again, the purpose of this isn't because you should do it. One of my favorite quotes is if you should too much, you'll should all over yourself and it's a big mess. But these are just opportunities for us to create that sense of connection and belonging in a time when we're surrounded by a lot of fear and uncertainty and change. Um, and if some, you know, kind of to wrap this up, um, Caitlin, Talk to us just for a moment about control and, and what we don't have control over and how this yeah. plays out with compassion. Yeah, it's very important. I feel like this last part is really important to play into these these actions of compassion because um, really what you're in control of is your attitudes and actions. And, and what this means is that you don't need to beat yourself up over not remembering to wash your hands at a certain point or possibly breathing in the air that could have a virus in it that's just out of your control. And so being really gentle with yourself and understanding of what you do have control of is your attitudes and actions. And those things play into, again, this whole idea of compassion is being able to act on what you know you can. And then also creating an orientation in yourself um, of a, a good attitudes and, and actions. Absolutely. So we'll leave you guys today with an awesome quote from Viktor Frankl, um, who's an amazing psychologist. He wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. And he actually wrote this in the Nazi, uh, after experiencing Nazi concentration camps in World War II. So a moment of, of true suffering. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. 
So again, this isn't anything you all have to do. It's not anything any of us have to do. It's just an opportunity for a moment of growth and freedom amidst everything that is happening right now. Mm-hmm. So that's it for today, guys. Um, a big thank you to Caitlin. Caitlin, you are awesome. Thank you Aww. so much, Caitlin. Yeah, thank you for having me. 